Welcome to Bible Baptist Church. Good to have you here today. Let's all stand and we're going to open our service in prayer. prayer. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you for the opportunity that you've given us today to worship you. And I pray today that, that we would worship you, that we would bring you all the glory, honor, majesty that you deserve. Help us, Father, in our feeble frailty as humans to be able to uh, worship in a way that is acceptable to you and that you administer to our hearts and glorify yourself through your word. Bring understanding, help us to grow, help us to grow closer to you. Uh, save souls, Father, and again, just glorify yourself. And we commit this service to you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Please remain standing. Hark this a shepherd's voice I Uh, this Tuesday is, is uh, election day. Uh, don't forget to vote. And on the back table are a voter's guide so you can know where the candidates stand on important issues. Uh, we are looking for helpers for our Christmas banquet. To see Portia, Amelia, or Sada if you are willing to help. The date will be Sunday, December 18th. A sign-up list is on the back table. Our, Thursday, our Thanksgiving service this year will be online and at church. The date will be November 23rd at 7 p.m. Uh, this Friday and Saturday is the men's conference. There are brochures on the back table. Uh, information is available on our website for, under upcoming events. And uh, tonight will be our communion service promptly at 6. This time I'll have the ushers come forward to take our general offering.
Amen. Thank you, Garrett. Please take your Bibles and turn to Psalm 75 for our scripture reading this morning. Psalm 75. And when you get there, let's all stand together for the reading of God's Word. And please follow along as I read Psalm 75. I'm going to read all ten verses and then we'll remain standing for prayer. Unto thee, O God, do we give thanks. Unto thee do we give thanks. For that thy name is near, thy wondrous works declare. When I shall receive the congregation, I will judge uprightly. The earth and all the inhabitants thereof are dissolved. I bear up the pillars of it, Selah. I said unto the fools, deal not foolishly. And to the wicked, lift not up the horn. Lift not up your horn on high. Speak not with a stiff neck, for promotion cometh neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south. But God is the judge. He putteth down one, and setteth up another. For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup, and the wine is red. It is full of mixture, and he poureth out of the same. But the dregs thereof, all the wicked of the earth, shall wring them out and drink them. But I will declare forever, I will sing praises to the God of Jacob. All the horns of the wicked also will I cut off. But the horns of the righteous shall be exalted. May God bless his word. Let's vow in prayer together. Father in heaven, we thank you that you are on the throne. We thank you that you are uh, in complete control of things. And uh, whatever's going on anytime in history, in any country, in any place, uh, your people... Uh, have a solace and a rock that we can flee to, and especially knowing that you are in charge, that you are in control. And Father, we look at what's happening in our country, and uh, we get distressed. Uh, Father, thank you that, that um, these things have not escaped your notice. We know that uh, as a country we are provoking you, but Lord, we know also that for those of you, us that name the name of Christ, Uh, We are confident. You are our rock. And no matter what things go on around us, uh, our anchor is sure. And Lord, I pray that you'd help God's people, help us as believers to be wise, to be good stewards of this gift that you have given to us of being Americans. In a time in our country, in a time in the world uh, where things are what they are, Thank you, Lord, that, that we still have a say. And I pray that this week you would help us to honor you by being good stewards of that stewardship. And we ask your blessing in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You may be seated. All right, let's take our hymnals to hymn 362, The Cleansing Way, hymn 362.
Good morning. It's good to have you again here today. Let's open our Bibles back to Psalm 75. And uh, again, I want to remind you that we have voters' guides. I think, are there any still back there? There are. We have voters' guides on the back from the American Fa- American Fa- Pennsylvania Family Council. And it basically is, uh, they, they sent out surveys to all the different candidates. Not all of them replied. The ones that didn't reply, they would uh, find out what their public policies were to give us the best idea of where people stand. There's not much on the ballot this time, uh, at least in our area here. Uh, but they are important um, races. So take advantage of this, and I hope, you, uh, hope you're registered to vote and that you plan to do that. Also, one thing I forgot to mention, that um, there, uh, Calvary Independent Baptist Church of Morton, Pennsylvania, is pastored by John Cartwright, and I have grown to love this man. Uh, he's been pastoring in Delaware County way longer than I have, um, but he has been faithfully serving the Lord. And they are having special revival, fall revival services. It's actually starting today, but please don't leave here when I'm preaching and go over there, okay? Um, But tomorrow, Tuesday and Wednesday, 7 o'clock each night, they're uh, having services. And the preacher is also a dear man. Pastor Dominic Penichetti is going to be the the preacher there. He's the pastor of Bethel Baptist Church in Fishtown neighborhood, the inner city of Philadelphia. Uh, He... he, um, he has also been pastoring my whole lifetime, and uh, he's just a precious man. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to go to these, uh, but I want you to be aware of them. Uh, again, it's Calvary ba- Independent Baptist Church in Morton, Pastor Dominic Penichetti. He is the only preacher. Yes, Michael? That's a good question. Um, I know they're having pizza after... <laughs> Uh, I don't see that on there, but you could probably just, you know, I'm sh- I think Calvary Independent Baptist Church has a website, and it would be on there. Um, pastor Penichetti is the only pastor. I, sometimes pastors tend to try to be comedians. I've known a couple. We had one in our Bible, in, in Bible school, our Bible institute, and it, it just didn't come off well. He is the only guy that I know that can, like, crack jokes a- and get away with it, and he's funny, but he's also preaching the Word, and I appreciate Pastor Penichetti, so... Just a, and Jim does too. Jim knows him. If you want a, a, a reference for Pastor Penichetti, you go see Mr. Kerr. Amen. All right, Psalm 75, everyone. Let's turn there, Psalm 75. If you have uh, annotations, a lot of Bibles will, will not put the uh, titles in Psalm. Now, keep in mind that the way our Bible is today uh, is not the way when it was first written. Uh, in other words, you and I have chapters and verses you know, when the Bible was first written over a long period of time, there were no divisions like that. Uh, in fact, it wasn't until 1551 where we had the layout of chapter and verses that we have today. So for many years, the scripture were just, you know, text. You had different books, epistles, uh, but you did not have the divisions that we had. But the Psalms were a little different. The Psalms, handed down through history, have... The titles in them, if you have a Bible where it has, uh, for example, in Psalm 75, if you have an introduction before verse 1 where it starts, Unto thee, O God, it would say, To the chief musician, Altesheth, a psalm or song of Asaph. How many of you have that in your Bibles? A good number of you. Not all. Oh, maybe, maybe more than half. Okay, that has been carried down and that is part of Uh, what was given to us, handed down. And so this is a song of Asaph. All the psalms were songs. This was written by Asaph, who was the chief musician of King David. And uh, it is called, uh, to the chief musician, and then it says, Altashith. You see that interesting word? That is a Hebrew phrase, which literally means, do not destroy. And there were four psalms, that have that as the title. So that's the title of this psalm. Do not destroy. And Psalm 75, Psalm 76, excuse me, Psalm 57, 58, and 59, and then 75. Those are the four psalms that have that same title. Do not destroy. And it is interesting because it is a a plea to God's people 
to trust in the Lord in the midst of, of turbulent times, knowing that God is still on the throne. And, and uh, in fact, one... Um, there's a phrase, which I think I deleted at the last minute. But in the introduction to the Psalms, one of the, the great commentaries of old called Treasury of David, which was compiled by Charles Spurgeon, uh, has this very eloquent statement about this psalm that uh, pictures the child playing in the den with a poisonous asp. And it was likening, this was Israel. Israel was at a time where they had enemies all around. There were dangers everywhere. And this was a psalm that some think was actually, it was written by Asaph, or it's a psalm of Asaph, but some think that it was when David ascended the throne and became the king, and gave his, you know, his, uh, what do you call that, the speech when he's taking the kingdom, that some think that this may have been David's speech that Asaph took and put to song. You know, it could be because it seems like this is a, kind of an official thing where David's kicking off his kingship. But here's the challenge. It is written to people who are in the midst of all kinds of upheaval. Politically, there were things that were just so unstable. There were things going around. Enemies, they had enemies. And this is a psalm to encourage God's people to remind them God is still in charge. And you and I need to realize that too. The, there's a theme in this psalm that really compares to a couple passages in the New Testament which came later. But the Bible says in the New Testament, God resists the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. And that really seems to be the theme of this psalm. That God resists the proud, and there's going to be, always be proud people that try to lift themselves up against God and His people. But God is in charge. And so we're going to look to this text, because you and I are living in perilous times. In fact, I, I wish I had not deleted that quote from Spurgeon. Uh, it was so eloquent about a child playing like with a poisonous snake and, and then a, a toddler in the cockatrice den, something like that. And I thought of that, first of all, for what's going on in our country. But Thea asked for prayer this week. She's going to be doing something that reminded me that that's like, you know, it's a, it reminded me what Thea's doing. And you and I are going to do something the very next day. Pray for Thea, by the way, on Monday. And then pray for us on Tuesday because, folks, we're going to vote. And as Christians, we have a unique opportunity historically to have a say in the political process. Do you realize that for centuries, God's people did not have that power? They didn't have the ability to vote. Their voice did not count. They simply had to, you know, what they had was what they had. In fact, that's, this psalm was written in one of those situations. So we're going to find hope today, but we're going to get three things. First of all, I want to give you my outline, then we'll pray and we'll just jump right in. Number one, what we must not forget during election time. And, and sometimes we as Christians get caught up in the moment. Number two, what we need to affirm when, and, and uh, of what God says about human government. And then finally, I want to share with you, the Bible says, remove not the ancient landmark which thy fathers have set. I want to share with you some quotes from our founding fathers that had to do with the stewardship that you and I have been given. That is this, this idea of being an electorate, of being someone that gets to vote. And, uh, and I want you to hear from some of the very men that gave us this right because they took it very seriously. So let's jump right in. Psalm 75. Unto thee, O God, do we give thanks. Unto thee do we give thanks for that thy name is near thy wondrous works declare. Verse 2, when I shall receive the congregation, I will judge uprightly. And this again, one of those, if David was ascending to the throne, and anticipating this, and, and perhaps even giving his coronation speech. That's what I was looking for. His coronation speech. And um, 
and making his promise to the people uh, very well. Could be, it, it seems to, that he's thinking of that. He says, the earth and all the inhabitants thereof are dissolved. I bear up the pillars of it. Verse 4, I said unto the fools, deal not foolishly unto the wicked. Lift not up the horn. Horn has to do with power. Lift not up your horn on high. In fact, a horn was an emblem um, of, of position. And then he says in verse 6 and 7, this is what I want you to look at tonight, this morning. For promotion. In other words, some people get set up, some people go down. God resists. God Resist the proud. God exalts the humble. He brings low. God abases the pride, proud, and he exalts the humble. Promotion cometh neither from the east nor from the west nor from the south. But God is the judge. He putteth down one and setteth up another. This is a reminder to us that no matter what happens in our lifetime, all around us. In fact, this is true not just in America. But in other countries, in other governments, where even they don't have the freedoms that we have or the influence, we must always remind ourselves, God is the one that gets the final say. And God is in charge. How important that is. Promotion. We could look at it and say, you know what? You and I, this, this Tuesday, we're going to vote for someone. And, you know... You might be thinking of someone, boy, I hope this person doesn't get in office. And I hope this one does. And we think, oh man, it's so critical that this person gets in the office. And we have to back up, folks, and remember, ultimately, God is in charge. So, here's here's the challenge of, of the general psalm, is that as God's people, we need to realize where our hope is. Sometimes Christians panic. Um, and I have heard this phrase since, the, since I was a teenager. When it seems to happen just about every election where you'll hear someone say, this is the most important election of our lifetime. Haven't you heard that too? Like all the time. Whoa, no! Are they important? They're absolutely important, especially because you and I have an influence. But folks, let's remember... Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Do you remember what that says? Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. You believe that? God wants us to. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. What goes against that is when we lean unto our own understanding. Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So as we approach unknown futures, as things happen, changes, we have to always remember, God has not given us the spirit of fear. And the only way we can do that is if we understand He's in charge. The only way. I just found my quote. Remember that quote I was looking for? It was in the introduction to Psalm 75. And the writer said, In holy faith, the sucking child plays at the hole of the asp, and the weaned child puts his hand on the cockatrice den. And there's some debate there about what a cockatrice is. Some think it's a dragon. It was obviously a dangerous creature. And so you've got this picture. And this is, this was the psalm was written in this for this. The people of Israel were the sucking child. And the, um, the, uh, the weaned child in a dangerous context. Folks, in many ways, that could be us, could it not? Christians in a world that is becoming more and more um, aggressive and, and not sympathetic with God's people. I want to remind you now with that in mind and I want to read a a few points from an article that I got as an email and it was a good reminder. I've always known these things to be true but some of you are, are not really involved at all in politics. Some of you maybe don't even have a position 
politically, and some of you are very involved in politics and definitely have a position. Um, but here's what I want to challenge you as a Christian. And here was the title of the, the article that was sent to me. And, and there was ten things in this list. I'm only going to read a few that I think are the most important. Ten fundamental things most right-wing conservatives do not know. Ten fundamental things most right-wing conservatives do not know. And the article started this way. It's from David Cloud. He says, The following are some of the fundamental biblical truths of life that the vast majority of contributors to the most popular conservative news sites do not know and do not take into account in their thinking. This includes Breitbart, Fox News, Right Wing News, Liberty Nation, Blaze, Front Page Mag, etc., etc. First, so the, keep in mind, so those of you that are really interested in politics and maybe you formed your opinions based upon scriptural convictions, you've grown a lot, I want you to always keep in mind that some of the news sources that may agree with our side as Christians, there's some things they don't understand. Number one, the world was made in six days by an almighty creator who is eternal, omniscient, holy, just, merciful, compassionate, who is king over all and works all things after his own will according to his eternal plan. Realize that. That people that may agree with you politically, and, and you see this, if you feed on news, understand something. They're not coming from the same worldview when it comes to the creator of the world. That's important that you understand that. Second, man was made in the image of God and his created purpose is to love God and glorify him and every man is accountable to him. That's something that uh, people that may agree with you politically, they don't understand that. That our purpose, we're put on this earth, folks, to glorify God. Third, all men are sinners against God's holy laws and are under his judgment thereby. All men are sinners. Fourth, the ultimate, and this is important, the ultimate conspiracy behind the scenes is the program of the dark powers that control the present world system led by Satan, a fallen angel who rebelled against God. Those dark powers are working out a program called the mystery of iniquity and the objective, and it, and it goes on. So a lot of people that may agree with you politically do not realize that the ultimate conspiracy is Satan. And I want to go back to Hezekiah. There was a time when the prophet met Hezekiah. He was a young king. And there was a, a plot. Some of you may remember this. It's in the book of Isaiah as well. Isaiah comes to him to give him God's message. And he says, Fear ye not uh, the confederacy or the conspiracy. And, and where God told him, I want to be your fear and your dread. So there was a plot that was going on. It re there really was a conspiracy back in Isaiah's time against King Hezekiah. The, some of the surrounding nations had already had uh, meetings in smoke-filled rooms, to use that phrase. And they were planning on, there was a literal plot to unthrone, dethrone this young King Hezekiah. And he found out about it and he freaked out. He just, he just panicked. And Isaiah came and said, don't worry. And don't say... Say ye not a confederacy, a confederacy, or a conspiracy. It is so easy to get paranoid and to get conspiracy theories. And I have heard professing Christians get caught up in some of this. I mean, I've heard people embracing every kind of paranoid conspiracy going on. Now, am I saying there's no conspiracies? No, there is. But ultimately, folks, the real ultimate conspiracy is what's going on spiritually. And that you and I need to remember. Fifth, at the same time, God is working out his program of gos global gospel preaching to invite all men to his free salvation in Jesus Christ. This program began with the resurrection and ascension of Christ. 
The book of Acts is the record of the beginnings of this program, and it remains God's main business in this world. You realize that a lot of people that may agree with you politically do not share the understanding of the gospel. What did Jesus say? What shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? We need to keep first things first. We need to understand the things that are important. And this goes on, but I just want to remind you folks that you've got to put everything on a spiritual level. That's the point of Psalm 75. When you take your eyes off of God and you look at what's going on around you, you will not be secure. You'll be unstable. You'll, you'll panic. And that's why Asaph, perhaps from the words of King David himself, is saying, listen, God is on the throne. No matter what's going on around us. And boy, you want to talk about a tempestuous monarchy... David, his whole life, there was not security there as far as humanly. He had sons and people and, you know, first he's chased by Saul and his whole life is a life of turmoil and insecurity. And so this is very appropriate to put things in perspective. Got to keep our eyes on the Lord. Next, we need to affirm something about the government. This goes back again to Psalm 75, verse 6 and 7. For promotion cometh neither from the east nor from the west nor from the south. God is the judge. He putteth down one and setteth up another. Now in a few minutes I'm going to talk about the fact that you and I and not every, not every country's Christians can say this. Where they have the opportunity yea, the stewardship to be involved in the process. They don't have a choice. They don't have a say. It is what it is for them, and they've got to put their eyes on the Lord. But you and I have a say, so we need, to, we need to do something. We need to be involved. But the bottom line is, because the bottom line is that whoever you think is going to be the best candidate may not be the best candidate, and you and I will be stuck with them. And we have to realize, sometimes God doesn't give us the people we want to be our leaders. Sometimes God doesn't even give us Honorable men and women to be our leaders. But they are our leaders. Are they not? And that's what Psalm 75 is about. Here's the, the truth. It's in Proverbs 21 and verse 2. The Bible says, and, and I know we don't have a king, but this is speaking of, the, this was talking to Israel and Israel's, all the kingdoms around, but it applies to us as far as authority goes. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. As the rivers of water, he moveth it whithersoever he will. I'm convinced there's an application there for, all, for people that are in authority when things are out of our hands. We had a situation that got us our first church building where a decision had to be made by a religious board of, of a religious people that were not on the same page as us, to say the least. Uh, and these were not born-again believers. And they were going to have to, there was like, I don't know, six, seven men, whatever, ten men on a board, uh, maybe some women too, I, I don't remember, but these people who were not, the, to my understanding, not blood-washed, redeemed people, were going to have a decision on whether or not we could move into a specific church building that ended up suiting us well for 15 years. And I remember God led me to this verse. I know that, that the interpretation, talking about this morning, is to God's people in relationship to other pagan nations as well. And it's true for our day. Now we're just talking about a church board voting. But I believe that God still, the people that are in authority, the, their hearts are in God's hands. Your boss, your boss may not be a believer. And, and you may have consternation about it. But you know what? Your boss's heart is in God's hand. And you, you can pray that God would move to do things. Even in a boss who's not, not interested. Your boss doesn't believe in prayer. 
Your boss would mock you. You believe the Bible. Your boss's heart is in God's hand. Don't ever forget that. And by the way, we started praying with that in mind. And there was every reason why this group of people should not allow us to rent their building. And they were concerned. They were concerned that we were going to start evangelizing, like handing out tracts right during their church service. You know, and they have, and, and they, they had every reason not to, but God opened that door. And, and we rejoice in that. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. I want you to turn to Nehemiah chapter 2. I want us to look at an example of Nehemiah. And that's right before Psalms, right before Job, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther is right before that. So to help you find the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 2. Now let's talk about his authority. When Nehemiah was alive, he was living towards the end of the Babylonian captivity. And actually Babylon was conquered by someone else. And then so they were now in charge. And there was a wicked king that was his king for that time. And the king's name was uh, Artaxerxes. And Nehemiah was the king's cupbearer. You know what that meant? He tasted the, he would taste all the liquid before the king did in case someone was trying to poison the king. Nehemiah took, had a risky job, but he became, a, he was a very trusted Jewish man in a non-Jewish government of, of a heathen king. And when you read about Artaxerxes I, son of Xerxes, I mean, it, it, he was brutal in many ways, and he got to the throne by some, uh, his father being murdered, and there's just all this, and, and, you know, obviously you've got, you've got unsaved people, heathen kings and heathen power, and yet in all this, God put Nehemiah, and God was still in charge. And so, the Babylonian captivity is over. They're starting to go back into the land of Jerusalem, which was destroyed by Babylon, you know, 70 years ago. And now Nehemiah wants to go and see what things are like. Jerusalem is laid waste. But he has to ask his boss permission to go. And that is a touchy subject. Because he's talking about his home country which has always been and could always be considered a threat to this king, Artaxerxes. And so we see in, in Nehemiah chapter 2 and verse 7, Nehemiah was very concerned and the king noticed it. And so the king asked him about it. In fact, I love the Bible says, so I prayed to the God of heaven. But look at Nehemiah chapter 2 and verse 7. He said, moreover, I said unto the king, if it please the king, let letters be given to me, the governors beyond the river, that they may convey me over till I come into Judah. So he had first broached the subject. He sensed the king. He's trying to, okay, can I even share this with him? And he did. And the king was surprisingly good with the idea of Nehemiah leaving his service and going back to his home country to assess the situation. That was an answer to prayer right there. A heathen pagan king. Now look at verse 8. And he's requesting, And a letter unto Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams of the gates of the palace, which appertain to the house, and for the wall of the city, and for the house that I shall enter into. This is not reading ahead of time. Like There were already several things that he prayed for that he had to kind of feel his way around. Like, all right, I'm going to mention this to the king and see how he responds. And none of them did the king's... What? You want to leave? He said, okay. What do you want? And so it was like one step after another step. And Nehemiah said, okay. And eventually he was able to get the king to provide supplies so they could go back. Now I want you to look now at verse 8. Uh, right after this, a letter unto Asaph, the king, keeper of the king's forest. And he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the palace which appertain to the house and for the wall of the city, for the house that I shall enter into. Now look at the next statement. And the king, wicked king Artaxerxes. Artaxerxes, who is not a God-fearing man. The king granted me, according to the good hand 
of the king. No. According to the good hand of my God upon me. Get a hold of what's happening, folks. The king's heart. People that are over us are not over the Lord. Understand that. There will be people in your life who have power. They've got sway. They could literally, just like, remember Pilate before Jesus? Don't you know that I have the power to give your life and take it? You know, he was surprised that Jesus wasn't showing him a little more respect. He says, don't you know that your life's in my hands? I can say now and you're dead. And Jesus said, you don't have any power except what God gave him. That's what Nehemiah is saying. Nehemiah is saying, you know what? In fact, look at it again. God, the king granted me. The king granted me according to the good hand of my God upon me. Always, always remember, God is the ultimate one that pulls the strings and allows what's in your life for a reason. Promotion cometh neither for, from the east, from the west. It is God. Do you believe that? Do you live that way? Oh, sometimes we forget. We think we wrestle against flesh and blood. Remember what Paul said in Ephesians 6? We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Flesh and blood, what's that? That's people. Which is still too generic. That's your boss. And I'm assuming some of you, some of you may be bosses. But that's, the, that's your neighbor. That's your family member. That's the person that you're, you know, maybe you're struggling with. They're flesh and blood. Maybe that's the person that has been your biggest cause of anxiety because of whatever influence. And God's saying, no, 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 wait a minute. We're not wrestling against this. I'm in charge. I'm in charge. But they could fire me tomorrow. Only if God allowed them. You know, think about it. If your boss wanted to fire you, but God did not want you to be fired, do you think God could intervene? Absolutely. Again, go back to what Pilate said. Pilate could not believe that Jesus was not bowing to him and saying, please let me live. Instead, Jesus very confidently said, don't you know, you have no power at all unless God gives it to you. We need to have that same attitude. Finally, I want you to go to Acts chapter 22. Acts chapter 22. Real quickly, try and set the context here. In, in this situation, Paul is being arrested. He's about ready to be imprisoned. And there's an, an exchange between Paul and one of the Roman soldiers. And now Paul was arrested. And by the way, Paul was a Roman citizen. But he was more importantly a citizen of heaven. And in Acts chapter 22 and verse 25, And as they bound him with thongs, Paul said unto the centurion that stood by, Is, uh, is it lawful for you to scourge a man, which they had just, just punished him physically, is it lawful for you to scourge a man that is a Roman and uncondemned? When, now, you and I might say, Paul, what does that matter? Who cares whether you're a Roman citizen or not? You're a servant of God and you should be willing to suffer whatever. Paul, you need to just trust God. But Paul took advantage of his Roman citizenship. When this, verse 26, when the centurion heard that, he went and told the chief captain saying, Take heed what thou doest, for this man is a Roman. Then the chief captain came and said unto him, Tell me, art thou a Roman? He said, Yea. And the chief captain answered, With a great sum obtained I this freedom. And Paul said, But I was free born. Then straightway they departed from him, which should have examined him. And the chief captain also was afraid, after he knew that he was a Roman, and because he had bound him. Now do you see what's happening? Paul is not renouncing his citizenship. He clearly understood he was a citizen of heaven. But he also understood that being a Roman citizen was not a sin. In fact, some of the privileges of being a Roman citizen that you could not, without fair trial, you could not be bound, you could not be scourged, the very things they were doing to him. And so he stood up, 
And he took advantage of that stewardship. And I submit to you, you and I have some privileges. If you are an American citizen, and there are some, some in our church, I love so many of our precious folks that come to America that have worked very hard to become a citizen, appreciate American citizenship more than some of us do. Uh, going to one of the swearing-ins, you know, the immigration, that's such a precious thing to see people that value being an American citizen. But, you know, your American citizenship means you get to vote. You get to have a say. You can actually, Tuesday, you can go and you can put you know, who you want in there. And I hope you, if you, now if I know I realize, you say, Pastor, why didn't you preach this two weeks ago? I could have registered. I can't, it's too late. Mm-hmm. All right, well, you could do it next time. But, but understand this. It is a stewardship that if you have the legal right and ability to do it, register to vote. Your vote, you say, my little insignificant vote isn't going to mean anything. Yeah, but you have one. You have one. You know, the Bible says, remove not the ancient landmark which thy fathers have set. And there's a whole context. That could be a whole message based on the landmarks that Israel had growing up to remind them of what God had done. But I want to submit to you and I want to share with you. Now these are not quotes from scripture. But these are quotes from some of the men that have given us some of the freedoms that we have. James Garfield, by the way, he was was an evangelist. He said this, Now more than ever, the people are responsible for the character of their Congress. If that body be ignorant, reckless, and corrupt... It is because the people tolerate ignorance, recklessness, and corruption. That's powerful. You know, there was a time in Israel's history where they just kind of had a laissez-faire attitude. In other words, what good are we going to do? You know, we, it says the prophets prophesy falsely. The priests bear rule by their means. In other words, God was saying things are bad. But then he said this. This was the biggest censorship of Israel wasn't that the prophets were prophesying bad lies and that the priests were in it for the money. Here was the biggest condemnation. My people love to have it so. Wow. In other words, yeah, there's bad stuff going on, but my people should be incensed and up in arms and doing something about it. But they love to have it so. And so again, Garfield said, about Congress. If that body be ignorant, reckless, and corrupt, it's because the people tolerate ignorance, recklessness, and corruption. If it be intelligent, brave, and pure, it is because the people demand these high qualities to represent them in the national legislature. And this is, this is prophetic. Listen to what he said. Many, many years ago, if the next centennial does not find us a great nation, it will be because those who represent the enterprise the culture, and the morality of the nation do not aid in controlling the political forces. Wow. Noah Webster. Remember him? He's the guy I'm always quoting. You know, First American dictionary. Before Noah Webster came up with the standardized you know, spelling and definitions. In fact, you read a lot of our founding documents in America and some of the same words are written different way, different ways. Because there was no standard until 1828 when Noah Webster came out with his English dictionary of of the language. Here's what Webster said. In selecting men for office, let principle be your guide. Regard not the particular sect or denomination of the candidate. Look to his or her character. When a citizen gives his suffrage to a man or woman of known immorality, they abuse their trust. They sacrifice not only their interests, but that of his neighbor, and they betray the interest of the country. Here's another one. John Jay understood. In fact, he wrote this. John Jay was probably one of the closest people religiously to what we believe as a Bible-believing Christian. And he said, The Americans are the first people whom heaven has favored with an opportunity of deliberating upon and choosing the forms of government under which they should live. Providence, God, has given to our people the choice of their rulers. 
And it is their duty as well as their privilege and interest of our Christian nation to select and prefer godly rulers. I've got so many other quotes here. John Adams said this, We electors have an important constitutional power placed in our hands. We have a check upon two branches of the legislature, as each branch has upon the other two. The power, I mean, of electing at stated periods one branch, which branch has the power of electing another. It becomes necessary to every subject then to be in some degree a statesman and to examine and judge for himself of the tendencies of political principles and measures. In other words, if we can, we need to find out what these people believe and vote according to godliness. I mentioned to you that the, the ballot this, this week may surprise you. That at least locally, there's only like, it's, you'll be in and out in no time. Unless you just stand there and look. You know, if you have no idea who you're going to vote for. Um, but there's like, I think four or five. You know, you've got the major, the ones for governor. You, I mean, you've got those major ones. And then the saddest thing to me, as I looked over the ballot is um, the last category is uh, representative in the General Assembly certain district, and there's only one candidate. And that candidate, according to their stated position, is not going to help our cause. And folks, there's things happening in America. There's things happening in Pennsylvania that are critical as far as the life of unborn people, as far as uh, this agenda that is being pushed, uh, the thing that, that we're praying for Thea, there's so many critical issues, and there's only one candidate, and then the other one, sh this person runs unopposed. And to me, that's sad. Because I'm looking at it and think, oh, why isn't somebody that stands for what's right? There's nobody, and that happens too many times. I hope you pray. Pray for America. Pray for Pennsylvania. If you don't sense it, folks, we are in trouble as a nation. And uh, I foresee, in fact, I mentioned um, an inch, on prayer meeting on Wednesday, I'll close with this. This was a, a, a religion that is not a gospel preaching religion, but bears the name Christian, a very large denomination and it was in Italy where one of their ministers of a local church, uh, I just just made a, what we would call harmless. He just talked about sin, certain lifestyles as being sin, and people walked out of the service. And then the bishop, over his hierarchy, scolded him and publicly went on record to say, "That's not loving. We don't have any place for this." And, and they removed him from performing church services at his service. And, uh, and, and that's, folks, I, I, I can see things happening. You know, when we went online because of COVID, a lot of churches scrambled just to learn how to do it, <laughs> us, uh, just to learn how to stream so they could communicate with their congregants. But as soon as they opened the doors, a lot of churches stopped streaming. And I totally understand why. Because when you go live and you're online and you, you preaching against things, uh, that could come back to bite you in a big way. And I realize that. But it also, I, I, we choose, as you know, still to do it online because if we can reach a few souls that are not reached, uh, I think it would be worth it. And I'm willing to take the risk. I understand. Folks, these last four years have been different than any of the past 26 that we have had before that. Because everything I used to preach stayed here. And now it's, it's there for all to see. And not everybody shares our views and the Bible's view. Um, so I, I want to ask you, first of all, again, if you're not registered to vote, don't. I'm not yelling at you, but I am challenging you, get registered to vote. You have something unique that a lot of countries don't have. You have the ability to let your voice be known. And then just pray. Again, I want to keep some of these quotes in mind about our need 
to, um, to vote godly. And I pray that you would. Let's bow in prayer. Father, thank you for your word. Father, we want, I want to pray for this Tuesday's elections. And Father, in light of this stewardship that we have given, and in light of Psalm 75, I am thankful that the future of Pennsylvania and the future of America is not based upon our choice of candidates because you are still on the throne. And Father, that's been true. That was true 20 years ago. That was true 30 years ago. That was true when Artaxerxes was on the throne. That was true when wicked King Nebuchadnezzar was on the throne and you called him your servant. And he certainly wasn't a child of God or in any way godly, but he was doing your bidding in the bottom line. Father, my fear is that we may, na- may not, in fact, in any way get leaders that we need, but we may get leaders that we deserve. Father, help us. Help us to be salt and light and help us to take seriously this stewardship of citizenship where we have the ability to vote and we ask your blessing now. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Let's take your hymn books out. Let's all stand, and we will close in song. All right, let's turn to hymn 621. We're marching to Zion in 621.
going on? How are you? How are you doing? You want to talk? You know, how are you? Can you the last couple of weeks? I don't know what I did. I, I did something. A series of things. I moved the, I moved, I have a boat laying on the side, and I had to pull it out and move it to get it away from the door so I could get in. They have to pretty it back to the little bit of the wall kind of move it to some movements that you can do. I can move a lot of weight a certain way. But that, and then I had to move a ladder. Thing you do, Mike. Slow, steady climb. It will come through slowly.
helicopter. I think I stopped it. Are we still streaming? It says, yeah, I'll, I'll stop it. Yeah, it was streaming at